Okay, so just want to check real quick, uh, see if you can see the slides. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so once again, my name is Jason Anderson. I'm the founder of Pre-Veteran, also a 24-year person that was in the Air Force and ended up retiring in 2014. I'd like to welcome all of you. Heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your schedule to listen to our employment prep webinar or workshop. We hope you get a lot out of it tonight. To kind of set the stage, let me kind of go into the next slide here. It goes without saying, uh, I mentioned it's a very casual conversation we're going to have here. Um, please call me Jason. Um, the other part to that is make yourself comfortable. I think I already mentioned that. The intent here is to learn and have some fun. So I want you to feel comfortable, be able to ask those questions that might come to your mind, whether you put it in the chat, raise your hand, go ahead and say, hey, excuse me, Jason, can I ask a quick question about that? I'm more than happy to do that. Please go ahead and interrupt if you have any questions. The next is uh, make sure you stay to the end. There is a Q&A specifically for questions that you have if you held them um, throughout the brief. And then there's also going to be a bonus at the end of this. All right. <clears throat> so let's start off with a agenda here. So for the agenda, I'd like to, um, I think I mentioned it in some of my other kind of discussions. If you've been following on LinkedIn, any of those kind of um, conversations that we had, but I'd also like to do what we do is real time information um, via a quiz. So what I'd like to have you do now as part of this exercise here, because we're going to get you real time information based on the quiz results that you do during this, which makes it really interesting because um, I just put it in the chat there. So I'm going to go ahead in a moment and we'll put a two minute clock on it. And then we'll just have a little bit of quiet as everybody goes to that quiz page. It's very few questions, but what ends up happening is it'll generate a report. And then just a bit later in the workshop, we'll go through that report. And it's usually very revealing what that the quiz has, because it has to do very specifically with uh, your transition and how you're planning for it. So once we do the quiz, we'll do a brief introduction to me just so you can get to know me better. I know there's a few people on the, uh, the Zoom who know me. There's quite a few who do not, a lot of new people. And then we want to talk about your journey, right? That's the most important thing because I want to help you have a successful journey and make sure you're addressing any challenges that you might need to overcome to have a successful transition. <clears throat> and then finally, we're going to be very specific about what you need to do to be ready for your post-military employment and then for the Q&A. So we're going to go to the next slide here and let's go ahead and take the quiz. It's in the chat right now and I'm going to just put a silent um, on my iPhone here, just a quick two minute clock to make sure um, to give you those two minutes. So I'll be silent here, go on mute and I'll be back with you, letting you know about the minute interval and then I'll let you know when the two minutes is up. Okay, that's one minute, one minute to go.
And all right, we're coming up on that two minute mark. Thank you very much for those that took the quiz. I think you're gonna find a lot of really good information that comes out of that when we look at everything in the aggregate. So let's go ahead and move on as we go through the workshop here. And we're gonna start off with Jason's journey here. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about me just to know that this is a shared experience, this transition thing that we're talking about here. So if you kind of go back, a, you know, roll the clock back a bit for me, I mentioned, if you could see on the right side there, 2014 was my planned military retirement. 2012 is when I had my, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And we all know this in transition. And uh, for those of you going through it now or will be going through it shortly, it is very much a physiological response, meaning it is going to trigger your autonomous or autonomic nervous system where you're talking about a fight or flight. So it really is a mind body sort of thing. We're not going to cover that in big depth tonight, but I'm just letting you know you are not alone. So what am I going to do? And these are the things that kind of entered my mind at the time. Should I do something completely different? Do I need to get another degree or an MBA? Do I need to get my PMP? Do I need to get my Six Sigma? And then finally, should I start my own business? So just to ask quickly, does anyone know which one I chose? <laughs> Any guesses out there? You wrote a book on it, didn't you? <laughs> I, whoever said that is yes, that is 100% correct. So I, I decided against all rationality out there. And we'll talk about why very specifically later. I said, Hey, I'm going to start my own business. Right. So just like someone was saying, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name of who did that, but I was like, Eureka, I really favorite like navigator. this idea. Oh, sorry. It was your favorite navigator. Ah, Ross. Appreciate that, Ross. Appreciate that. And I ended up did write a book called active duty entrepreneur. So this is where I and captured, um, Alex in the chat says uh, PMP. That was his oh. uh, guess. <laughs> I think that's a very popular one for sure, right? So I, I probably picked the hardest path, but the reason why I did that is because we we were going to move to Wyoming. There were no jobs there uh, that that suited any of my skill set. So as a result, um, it ended up being uh, I'm going to start a small business, and my wife thought I was insane. Um, nonetheless, I really did kind of learn some really important things that were baked into pre-veteran like. Right now, when you're getting paid, you have health care, and you're in the protective military ecosystem is a great time to prepare. And that really is kind of brought out in the book, although the, that's facing or addressing entrepreneurship at the time. So let me tell you also one more thing about my career uh, that is very germane. And I wrote about it in a LinkedIn post today, if you saw it, but here's me with a whole bunch of Japanese people. And this is when I was in the 401st tactical airlift squadron as a exchange pilot. And this was beginning in 2003. So what was interesting about this, and um, we're not gonna get into the super specifics of, of um, exactly why uh, right now, we'll get into it later down in the brief, but that experience in Japan is very much germane to the transition discussion here. And I just wanted to share this with you because it's gonna show up later in the presentation. Let me, okay, so now we're going to move on and continue. So once I retired out of the military, 2014 to the present, I want to give you a little bit of context to how pre-veteran kind of came around. So following 2014, moved to Wyoming, had the small business. Next thing you know, from different folks I worked with at the Pentagon in my last six years, <clears throat> I actually had a discussion with one of my friends and he said, hey, they have a remote role open in Rockwell Collins. And Rockwell Collins is a defense, uh, aerospace defense company, at that time a $6 billion company. <clears throat> so I applied for one job, got the interview, got the job. Next thing you know, I'm an entry level business development person. But as part of my self transformation I did in the years prior for my entrepreneurship kind of activities, I felt very comfortable moving from the public sector to the private sector, which is part of the story. And I started pitching ideas for how to increase international growth, not knowing that that's what they wanted to do within that aerospace company. Next thing you know, I'm identified and they make me into the managing director of North Asia, which means I've got the purview for business for Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. <clears throat> this is significant because it's a several, uh, it's a big promotion and I get to see all facets of the business while they expatriated myself and my family 
over there from 2015 to 2018, almost 2019. But while I was there, of course, I'm going through reflection. I've always been absolutely fascinated with transition because at the end of the day, it's an individual human endeavor. I started asking myself, why was I successful? Others haven't been. What's going on with military transition? And ended up doing a whole lot of research. <clears throat> and what I found out is that there is a two-year gap, and I've talked with probably quite a few of you on this call, but there's a two-year performance gap following military transition where if you take any number of measures, whether it's higher education, um, employment, wellness, or entrepreneurship, veterans kind of struggle in that two-year period after transition, but then after that begin to actually outperform the general public. So I'm starting to figure, now that I know that there's a two-year gap, um, I was happy that I found that because that's not necessarily very clear in the research out there right now. I wanted to figure out why. So what I ended up doing is going and I found, um, you know, I went through academic disciplines, sociology, anthropology, all these different things, ended up landing on cognitive neuroscientists or neuroscience and ended up hiring a cognitive neuroscientist for a year who taught me all about cognition, metacognition, how people think. And then this became a really central focus of pre-veteran. So this is where we ended up creating pre-veteran and some may or may not know, but we ended up launching last year in March. And that is how it began is that journey of mine right there. So with that part of the journey complete, um, I'd like to go into your journey now. I just wanted to give you a little bit so you know that I felt very similar to you and what you're going through now. And that's why I think what we have and the different kind of methodologies and programs we have that could help you out. So <clears throat> here you go, running toward transition, right? Here's your metaphorical transition wall. You're all getting close or approaching it. But as you know, there are a bunch of unknowns on the other side of that wall. And what's interesting about the unknowns is how they manifest themselves in your mind. So this is the next point I want to kind of get to is you all know there's unknowns, but perhaps we need to go a bit deeper on figuring out what those challenges and how they play out in your head. So naturally, it's going to engender a bunch of questions that you have to address, right? Or you have to think through because your mind is telling you this. Some of the questions your mind may provide you is, when should I start? What do I need to do? Who's going to help me? But then as you go through that thinking process, because it's so unfamiliar and there are so many unknowns, your mind might be telling you something like, I can push it off. I still have time. I'm going to just have to figure it out on my own or I'll be ready after tap. Now, none of these things have to be rational, but what's really interesting about an individual mind is that it's very compelling when your own mind is telling you these different things. So I want to get a bit more specific about how the mind is actually playing into this, and then also how this kind of filters into what we call the military transition 1.0 paradigm. So I'm going to head first, uh, I want to stop. Um, sometimes I always get ahead of myself, but are there any questions on the challenges or can any, does anybody want to share some of these things that they think about as they, as they're going through preparing now? So Jared in the chat <clears throat> said that knowing that the unknowns exists is a tremendous advantage as well. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I know that, you know, military people were such an amazing talent, right? Um, but one of the things I think that is really important about us is we would love to know, we want to know the lay of the land. And I think a lot of times what's missed is the lay of the land, what's going on in your own mind. So let's go ahead and, and pivot next to the next slide where we talk about the challenges that you have to overcome when you're talking about getting ready for transition, because right now the the what we talk about is the current system is what we've labeled the military transition 1.0 world. And this is a tap centric world. Let me walk through a build a slide. And then I'd like to get feedback from the group on how accurate this is, because this feeds into that questionnaire that we had talked about just a moment ago. So to kind of set the stage, the way we couch transition 1.0 is it's a tap, a transition assistance program, government program. 
that has kind of set the stage since 1991. So it's kind of dominated the space, therefore it's dominated the thinking. Yet the attributes that come from research that talk about the, tra the, TAP, pro the TAP program <laughs> is that it's a one size fits all, it's too general, it lacks individual specificity, it occurs too late in one career, one's career, and it's a kind of check the box training. So can, can uh, folks that have either done it or heard from an independent party, can you say whether that's true or not? Absolutely. Hey Jason, this is, oh, sorry. This is Daniel. Um, I'm at 18 years or 19 years now. So I'm in the Air Force getting ready to transition as an enlisted airman. And I've gone through TAPS, but I have, I have two master's degrees and I have my, my, my scrub certification. It, and everything they taught, they taught, at least for me in that class was you're starting from scratch. It's, you know, very airman, E4, E5, young airmen geared towards them. It didn't really, wasn't helpful to me at all. And I've took it a, a couple of times already. And it just maybe, maybe it was the instructor, maybe it was the curriculum, but it just wasn't helpful at all. Um, Daniel, I, I think that is a very shared um, kind of uh, response, whether you've been through it once or twice or not yet, and you've heard from a third party. This is kind of our point is that, that it needs to change. But one of the things I'd like to kind of explain is that you guys are smart folks, right? So what ends up happening because of this 1.0 system that researchers say is not working, and you've heard either anecdotally or have direct evidence that it doesn't work for you, you're going to intuitively know that it doesn't work, right? Whether you've been told that explicitly or implicitly, you kind of say, wow, that's not going to work for me. So you're going to try to figure it out on your own. It is a true military axiom that we do and we will prevail, right? That's how we think. So what do you do? <clears throat> your brain opens up to all kinds of different information sources out there. Social media has exacerbated this. But what ends up happening is the researchers out there and the influencers are going to tell you some things. They're going to provide recommendations, and those are going to be very influential to how you think. So here's some of the things that kind of come up. They're find a mentor, build a network, do informational interviews, and create a resume. Now, just to, just to get a, a quick straw poll, I'm kind of wondering um, how many people have heard that as you go through different social media, whether it be LinkedIn or Facebook. Does everybody kind of agree with that? <laughs> Mark, a lot of hands going up right now. So we'll just kind of say that's true, but let me, let me kind of go to the next layer because specificity becomes really important. Transition is very individual and you need to know very specific um, kind of uh, uh, ways to get around this. So um, Mark, did you have a question or are you just putting up your hand? Okay, so we'll... Here, we'll go to the next slide, right? So I think all of us would agree, right? Because we're all very educated. Um, and when you kind of look at it from an academic standpoint, finding a mentor, building a network, doing informational interviews and creating a resume makes absolute sense, right? It does. But then when you go into the next layer of details, this kind of turns into a house of cards really quickly. So let me explain. When you do find a mentor, what do you ask them, right? When you do find that network, what do you ask them? What do you ask the interviewee or the interviewer to get you good information you need to really turn the dial on your transition? And then finally, a resume. Okay, but resumes are for specific roles in the company, and we'll get to that in a minute. So how do I do that if I haven't done the work up front to make sure who I am, what I want to do? then these things make sense, but not putting them in front. And I'm, I think that's what the 1.0 system is doing right now for everybody. So what does this practically mean then? It means that what you're doing out there is you're starting to feel good and you get a little bit of, hey, I'm doing the right thing and I know I'm out there doing something, but it's a veneer, right? Because is it really turning the dial on what you need to do to be successful? And you can be the judge of that, right? But more than likely, What's happening is it's just going to make you spin your wheels more, and then you're going to look like me like this uh, back in 2012 when I was back to the beginning going, it's been months and I've done a bunch of things and I still haven't really gotten to where I need to go right now. 
So this is the point I'm making. So um, are there any questions or something that uh, somebody would like to bring up as a comment to this analysis right here? So Jason, a couple questions that um, kind of came up in the last little bit was Mark uh, McElmurray says there is no MOS roadmap to the career that he wants. Um, so I don't know if you want to address that. Briefly. I would love to address that. So as part of this, and maybe I should add this into the next kind of discussion, but um, what, what I think you're referring to is a translator, right? And, and as part of the 1.0 system, what they're trying to do is have you translate what you do to civilian speak. And what we do in pre-veteran is something 180 out from that. We have you make sure you understand enough about the private sector and how it's structured and knowing what they do for that job, or sorry, in that business to actually make money in the profit-making enterprise. And then you could start beginning figuring out how you actually add value to that. So it's not a translation, it's a transformation. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, if that's okay, Mark. <clears throat> Oh. Hey, Jason, this is uh, Brian. I, I, I'm kind of already following this. Um, there is value in it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but what I've experienced, you got it just like with any uh, media source, you got to know your source, right? And so half these knuckleheads, uh, they're, they're doing what they're doing. You know, and, and you got to question it. I do believe there is. Value. I have an ACP mentor. Um you know, I have a different kind of background. I had a break in service. So I was already out in uh, the public sector uh, for Dallas Corporation before that. Um, that helps, you know, with that experience. I know how to ask questions. I know exactly. Um, anyways, do, do I think that this will land me the job? Uh, no, but is it a strategy? Do I have this as a strategy along with a headhunting firm, um, along with attempting to see your 2.0, absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm here to learn. But uh, and on the resume aspect, th this is the I, I think one of the most frustrating pieces of it, at least from I'm Army, and I'm at the executive level, and the installation I'm at just doesn't do anything uh, for your resume. And the mixed messages, mixed messages you get from uh, people that are, have that have gotten out and. Uh, so what I did just to start throwing it out um, as another strategy, I just built a, what I call my general purpose resume. And I'm actually getting hits on that. Um, and then from there I go in and attempt to go and do informational interviews because I don't know what position, what general management role specifically and what industry I want to do because I have no clue. Um, and so that's sort of the approach like I said, there, there's value. At the, is it going to give me my end state? I have no idea. Yep. And, and what you're bringing up sounds very rational to me, right? It, it's just what I think, and, and you're a little bit different because you do have an experience because it sounds like you had a break in service and you do have, you know, some knowledge of how the private sector works. That's a, that's a big deal, right? I'm sure as you go at it now, while there's still more unknowns, there's fewer than there were the first time, right? So it's actually here. Let me kind of progress and we can answer those questions as we go on into describing what you need to do specifically. And then I'd love to get feedback from you and the others as to where that goes. So here's our, our weird cat kind of looking through military strategy right now. I'm going to share um, this type form, right? So you guys went through the quiz. Um, I'm going to now share that information with you that you guys filled out. So let me see how many folks did the quick. Whoa. So we added an additional 25 people. So now there's 86 responses and I'm going to go through this right now. So let me be as clear as I can with this. This, these are your answers, right? So we had you take this test before we went through the material. So I'm just going to go through this and then we'll have a little discussion about how accurate it is. So can I get a comment for why people are coming to pre-veteran to listen that are very, typically married and with children? Can I get a, can a, is there a good reason for why people married with kids want to come to pre-veteran or at least hear what we have to say? Yep. 
Uh, I'm seeing it right there from a bunch of different folks concerned about taking care of their family. They have obligations. Absolutely. Right. And they don't want to take risks or at least unnecessary risks. So let's let's keep that in the back of our minds as we go through this. Right. So married with kids. How confident are you that you understand the differences between the public sector and the private sector? And you can see now that the numbers have changed significantly, somewhat confident or not confident at all is still around 80 80%. So it's 80, 20 around that. So you are somewhat confident or not confident at all as a group, which makes sense about the differences between the public and private sector. Take a moment to think about your post-military transition success. Can you see a clear path forward? And you can see right now it's 60, 40 split. No, you can't see a clear path forward. And that makes sense. You haven't done it before. Which of the following thoughts have entered your mind as you're about to pair, prepare for post-military employment? Should I do something different? Do I need to get another degree? PMP, Six Sigma, start my own business? You can see those tests very high, right? And then we get back to these central questions that the influencers and the researchers are telling you. As part of your plan for a successful transition, which of these are you doing now or plan to do later? Build a network, find a mentor, do informational interviews. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Based on the network, informational interviews, and um, your uh, mentors, do you know what questions to ask them? And you can see it as a resounding no, 90-10, that you don't know, or you not really, or sort of don't know which questions to ask, which is basically what our thesis kind of entails before we even took you through it, right? So, Here's probably the most, the most concerning, honestly, to me, because I want you all to be successful. I want all of us to be successful. We want to create better veterans, one pre-veteran at a time. That is our central focus in pre-veteran. So if you look at this, right, through this logic that we just took you through, which we believe is an influencer from the military transition 1.0 TAP world, the majority, the strong majority, um, 50%, 20%, so that's 60-ish right there, 65% of you are giving yourselves less than a flip of a coin chance that you're going to be successful, right? With your own logic that you just went through this quiz, even though you're married with kids. So as, as, the, as the founder and just as a concerned veteran, I, I don't like this trend, um, and I want to desperately change this trend, which is, is why we're kind of going into why we created Preveter, because we recognize this, and we think we have a really good finger on the pulse of what's going on with this 1.0. So we'll start with that, right? So let's move into the slide deck again, and let's figure out what to do about it, right? So here, here's where we shift in the presentation and we start telling you or giving recommendations for what we believe you should do to address this very specific 1.0 world, right? So what do you do? What do you, what you need to do at a high level right here? So there's two different things. First, you look at the unknowns there. Here's what we recommend. You need to change the way you think before you take off the uniform. And by before, we're talking about one to three years before. Now, if you're under a year, don't be worried. It's just that we know as you're in descent for transition, you have a lot of obligations. So it's best to address the thinking or mindset shift a year to three years prior. The next is learn about those unknowns. And what we mean specifically by that at Preveteran is become aligned to the private sector's needs and wants, right? So here's why this is really important and let's get more specific because the more specific we get, the better. So when we talk about changing the way you think, here's why you need to change the way you think. It's context. So thought. this is the chain of custody going from thoughts to outcomes. So thoughts create behaviors, which create actions, which create outcomes. Therefore, if you can just change the way you think, right, and you begin changing your behavior and more importantly, doing actions to reinforce it, you will have a different outcome. And that's what everything is based, or what we do is based around, is it begins with the thoughts, it's reinforced by actions, and that's going to lead to better outcomes. Does it, I want to get a feel from the group. Does that, does that make sense from what we're saying or what we're saying here?
I'm getting some yeses. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, it, it, it sounds really simple, but of course, it's not that simple, right? I mean, changing people or getting people or helping them to change themselves, you first got to recognize that. And I think Jared is the one that brought that up. So it's a, it's a very insightful point. So let's move into more specifics, right? So here's the next thing. Um, this is, remember going back to my journey and we talked about when I was uh, in Asia and uh, I hired a cognitive neuroscientist. So we created our own modeling based on metacognition of how people think. And we are pretty confident that we've modeled this to such a specific point that it becomes a tool for you, which is part of our program. Um, we want you to know that your mind, right, is thinking about transition and, and, and how you think is based on the long-term memories you either have in your head or do not have in your head. So let's use, for example, uh, we'll use, because I could see him right here, Brian Smith, right? Everyone in this call or in the Zoom at some point is going to go, I got to get ready for transition. That thought will enter their brain because it's very important and it's something that's significant because you have obligations. What happens then is really interesting though. It's going to meet your long-term memory because your long-term memory is used to facilitate thought and metacognition. But what the challenge is with you, you folks and me and everyone else that's been through transition is that you're equal parts ignorance and hubris in your own brain. The ignorance piece is outside of, I think, Daniel, who said he had done it before. None of you have done it before, right? So what ends up happening from a functional standpoint is you, you stop thinking or you're unable to think. And that's where we get in our, uh, our metric, our research, where you can't see a clear path forward, right? But guess what happens? Your brain tries to keep you moving in the right direction. So it, it opens up its channels to listen to the external environment. And the external environment is, is making you think, should I do something different? Do I need to get another degree? Do I need to get my PMP? Do I need to get six, six Sigma? And our most recent addition is all I need is skill bridge, right? I mean, these are thoughts that inevitably are going to enter your mind, but I need you to ask yourself if doing these things is going to deplete more resources and not get you where you want to go necessarily. They become something where you begin spinning your wheels even more, right? So that's something we got to be mindful of how your brain is going to react to you having never done it before. So we call that the brain gap. And those are the logical results from a neurological standpoint of how you're going to think and why you're going to think. So we think that's a useful tool. On the other end of the spectrum is where it gets actually a little more insidious, right? And we call this the hubris part where the military mindset heuristic, really fancy word for saying you will inevitably try to, um, you will try to bring one for one, your military related memory into the private sector. And oftentimes those don't align at all. And this is part of the problem. And remember, this is your brain telling you this. So you're typically- It's a Zoom like hire, pre-veteran hiring. Oh. <laughs> hey, let me, let me hit. Uh... Can you please go on mute uh, for the iPhone that just jumped on? Thank you. Um, so what I was saying is, so the hubris part of this is, which is even more insidious, um, from a, from a brain standpoint, you're going to try to carry over those military related memories, which may or may not be aligned. So let me give you a few examples, right? Now think about it just from a common sense standpoint. Um, you've never transitioned, at least the vast majority, 99% of you in this zoom have never done it before. You will try to figure it out on your own. It's a total military axiom, even though you've never done it before, Right. The other part is just because you have an AFSC or an MOS, your command, your commander, your unit has always asked you to do things beyond your MOS or AFSC. Hey, I know you're a pilot, but we need you to do this. Hey, I know you're an HR specialist, but we need you to do that. You've done that thinking pattern so many times of doing everything and being the generalist, inevitably, inevitably, you will try to think that the private sector values a generalist and they do not, right? They're looking for a hyper-specific, skilled, um, credentialed individual to fit into it. And we'll show you why in a minute. 
but you, can you see where your generalist instincts do not fit well with the private sector? Then um, thinking you don't need the change for transition, right? And, and this is something we're opposed to, but this is what's frequently out there in the research space. For whatever reason, researchers don't wanna tell you that you need to change. And we're, we're just telling you, we're giving you another pathway. Uh, we think you need to change, you're gonna be more successful if you're able to do that. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep going, but the bottom line for the slide is what's really important know what your thoughts are and keep them in check because they're going to have you spinning your wheels and looking in all different directions and it may not get you where you need to go. So let's move on to the next thing here. Here's one other thing you need to do to get a job. This is probably one of the more important slides in the deck, right? You have to zero in on a specialty. And when I say zero in, let me give you a little bit of private sector kind of gouge here, right? The private sector is vastly, vastly different than the public sector in this regard. They have to make money before they spend it. And making money is such a challenging thing that what they do is they actually have what they call an approved headcount of the company, which means there's a certain number of full-time employees that have been blessed from the president down or the CEO down in different divisions where you have X number of people. And when you only have X number of people, there is no room for generalists. You have to have hyper-specific credentialed individuals that do their very specific job. What does that mean for you? That means in order to get that job that's on the job board of the company, you have to know what industry, company, role, and level that you want to be in, which means that's going to take some time to figure that out. Now, there's a way to do that, right? And we have ways to do that and we'll get at that in a moment. But that is, if anyone is telling you anything different than that, I don't think that's sound advice that you should listen to because job boards, um, smartly said by one of our graduates lately, is that that is their resume to get you into the company. They're telling you the, they're telling you the, the company, obviously, the role, the actual job description and the level of employment. And then they want you to go to that, but you have to know what that is in order to be effective. And any questions on that? Specificity, very important. Okay, so let's move on to this. So something else we strongly recommend, right? What you need to do, adopt a transition 2.0 mindset. We kind of talked about this, but let's do a comparison real quick. Left side is the current transition 1.0. Right side is what we're trying to do at Pre-Veteran with the 2.0. If you can imagine the 1.0, right, it's very transactional in nature, right? So there's recruiters, there's headhunters, there's skill bridge, all these things. It's really about just getting you a job. And what's unfortunate about that is we never talk about the second, third, fourth order of magnitude things that happen with employment issues because we're simply talking about like moving you from the military into a job. And that does not serve you well at all, because there's other things that are really important that we need to get to. And I'll tell you about that in 2.0. Um, and then again, getting back to the 1.0 doesn't really do you a service by letting you know that you, you're fine the way you are and don't need to change. So, and, and change the way you think, I should say, rather. <clears throat> the 2.0 system is transformational. So I want us to go from transaction to transformation right? This allows a much deeper, longer-term employment conversation. Here's a couple examples. If you're in the 1.0 world, if you're just talking about to get a job, you're never going to talk about, is it the right job? Am I getting in in the right salary band? Where am I at with the market rate or ratio with my salary? If I start low as a salary in a company, I'm going to stay low. That's just the way it's organized and the way HR and the hiring manager handles it. However, if we're able to get into those deeper conversations to make more money, you're going to start by making more money and continue in the company because you know what they do, what their product line is, what their customer face or, or what their customers want. And you're going to be able to integrate into that company, company much easier. It's not transactional. We have to get people to change and understand those differences. So need to make you aware that you need to change how you think and know how to align to the private sector. You will be successful, but it takes time. It's transformational. So let me tell you the next thing, um, getting help on your journey, right? And, and we've already had a bunch of people here talk about 
or not a bunch, we've had a few people talk about the different things they're doing right now. Whomever you go to, what we recommend is that you have a proven framework, right? A framework is not just a five-day seminar in TAP. It's not just a one meeting with your ACP uh, mentor. It's not one thing on Veterati because they put you at the center of the, of the wheel, right? You're the hub reaching out for different information, but you don't have a framework. So we need to have you have a, a framework that we know will work. On top of that, we have to make sure that framework is transformational, not transactional, right? The other part is you need to be given individual tools that are actually useful for you to go do things. Because going back to how thoughts influence behaviors, actions, and outcomes, you have to go do things to change the way you think and begin changing your mindset. And that's going to take some work with tools. And then finally, you got to have sustained support, right? You got to have someone there who has the framework and the tools who can support you because it is a transformational individual journey. That is military transition. So let's me go back to this, right? I kind of I kind of promised you as we went through the beginning of the presentation, I kind of want to wrap it up here um, toward the end and talk about this guy, Jason, who's kind of covered uh, on the right side there. Here's what Japanese told me about life and frankly, transition. I was going, I went through language school in downtown Tokyo. It was a 15 month program. It frankly was not enough. And at the end of the day, right, I had to be able to speak Japanese well enough in order to be functional in my job. There was no faking it. You can either do it or you can't. And I make this analogous to transition. You're either ready or you're not. There really is very little in between. And we desperately want you to be ready. And we want you to be confident. And we want you to command more salary. And we want you to be happy and fulfilled in your job. But that does take work. That takes work. And that framework, tools, and support we told you about. So the, the big takeaway there was, you're going to be ready or you're not, just like I was back in Japan when I was going to that assignment. Any questions or comments there? In the last couple slides here, and then we can have Q&A. Okay, so now that I've told you that, right, and we've told you about the proven framework, individual tools and support, I'd like to tell you what pre-veteran is doing as a offer to you and something for you to consider, right? So what we do is we do an employment prep course. This is a five-week hybrid course, right? It's based on the proprietary cognitive neuroscience models we talked about to get you to think differently, have different behaviors, do actions and outcomes. Each week is 20 to 40 minutes of knowledge, minutes of knowledge transfer. It's done via learning management system. We know you're busy. All of our previous students have liked the fact that they could do this on their time, right? It's not something you have to attend in person. However, once a week, we do have a one hour Zoom with me, where if you have any question on the week's material, you could bring it to the Zoom and we can have a group discussion within the cohort. In addition to that, there's a private LinkedIn group that's just for the cohort. So you can ask those questions you may not ask in the public uh, domain that you could talk to because you're having a shared experience with your cohort. And then you also have one-on-one -on -one coaching with me at your discretion, right? If you have some additional stuff that you want to ask or be frank about, you can always get on my calendar and do that. We have assignments to make sure you're reaching out, doing things to change your thinking. And then finally, we continue that sustained support by putting you into an alumni network where you continue your development with this. Five weeks will never change you one for one. It gets you on the right track, though, and then within the alumni network group, we continue your development and your iterations that we have. So specifically, here's what we do with our five weeks. And just so you know, the learning management system opens every Friday with the subsequent week's material, which is really important because we know that you guys are type A. We know that you are go-getters and you want answers. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to be disciplined in your approach and you have to go along with the program because each week purposefully builds off the prior week. 
So we have you make sure that you master that week before you go into the next one, because you are going to want to go too fast. You just want someone to give you answers. And that's not how transformation happens. So the first week, is the intro tech ready for transition, which is more than LinkedIn, by the way, this is technical integrations to make sure that you could put those together, reach out to a subject matter expert in a particular field, make sure you're getting good information. So that's the technical connection side. Week two is where we talk about that messaging in your head and we have different ways to make sure we identify it, overcome it so that you're ready in week three to understand and not fight us on what the private sector really wants and needs. Because again, you have to break it down to the industry, company, role, and level, period, in order to get a job. Because that's how they advertise it. And you you got to be able to fit into their system, right? And then finally, the capstone project is designed as an iterative method to make sure you continually over and over and over and over do it. Because once you become proficient at the method itself, you actually become much more confident, you're able to gain information and your cognitive cycles become significantly more aligned to the private sector. And it actually, dare I say, becomes easy, <laughs> which is a good thing. So let me tell you the price. The price is 497 bucks. Let me be very upfront. I know right now in your minds, some of you, you're going, why should I pay for this? And the answer is pretty simple. There's two reasons. One is, you have so much going on in your life right now, so much family, kids, uh, different kind of stressors that are out there, work, training, everything. You must prioritize your transformation, right? If you believe that you need to change, and that's what we believe you need to do, takes time, takes framework, sustained support, and you need to put it at enough height, enough attention where you're actually out there doing the work. This isn't sitting in on normal training with, uh, you know, your military training where you kind of turn off the brain and just kind of go that that will not work with this. So we do that for that reason. The other part is the world outside of the military ecosystem operates on a value based system. People pay for value. And I can tell you, I did not understand that when I left the military and it impacted me from an employment standpoint negatively. Because I, as, an, as a business development person, entry level, I did not understand or have a feel for the product value because we had been given so many different free things in the military, we have no sense of what things are worth. So why would we continue that if that is not reflective of what's going on in the real world? Those are two of the big reasons why we charge. Okay, so here's the final, second final slide. So for this time only, we do this with our webinars, right? We appreciate you putting in the time, listening, uh, going through, considering what we're saying, being critical if need be, right? Challenging us. We want to make the best possible experience for you. 10% off for the next 24 hours, as defined as tomorrow night, midnight at Mountain Standard Time, where you can get 10% off the course, which is 50 bucks, right? And all you have to do is go through, um, and I'll put it in here in a minute, the courses page, and you go to the enroll now button. So let me kind of show you how this works. So here's the courses page, and I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Let me, <clears throat> here is the page. What you're going to do is you could look through the same information. You could look through our testimonials, but you click on the enroll now button. And let me kind of show you, because the, the gateway is a little different now. You can kind of see here, depending on if you're mobile or if you're desktop, you're going to see this right here where it takes you through the checkout. And you'll see this little carrot up here that says view order summary. Yep. And you can kind of see here as it's pulled down, here's the coupon code. So again, the, the kind of um, the, the, view, the, the look of it has changed, but I wanted to show you where that was because we always get questions after this. Hey, where was that? So I want to make sure I covered that now. So I came real close to my target of being done in 50 minutes. I'm super close, um, but I want to open this up to any q and I'm happy to stay as long as there are questions. This is really important stuff um, for you, your family, your future success. So I'm very open to whatever questions you got now. Yes, good evening. My name is uh, Josh Eisenman. And my question is, how often is, uh, is this course offered? 
if I have, if I'm enrolled in a college course or I'm taking a certification, um, I want to be able to put my full energy into your program. That is an awesome, oh, thank you for reminding me of two things. First, great question. So what we're doing in 2022 is we offer it three times. It's going to be February, June, and October. Um, the other part I wanted to tell you is that the commitment, right? So the commitment is like usually two to three hours per week, but it's done on your time, right? So um, not including the one hour Zoom. So maybe three to four hours per week. And, you know, each week is going to be slightly different based on that. So um, you don't have to do a lot to transform. It's just a complete mindset shift. So that's what makes us really excited about this. Did, th did that help, Josh? Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So just bringing up uh, questions that came up in the group from earlier, I think we've probably already addressed the MOS roadmap and that not being a great tool trying to translate your military job, whatever you did, to a civilian job on a one-for-one -one basis like they attempt to do in TAP. Um, I don't know if you want to discuss that more, Jason, but that was one of the questions. And then the other one, I'm kind of sad that Dan left because he has, or he brought up that TAP is focused on junior enlisted, networks take care of senior officers, senior NCOs and junior officers are missed by both. So his presumption is that you have these two co cohorts that are missed by the TAP program. But I think um, through what we just talked about, it's kind of missing everybody, uh, maybe not as equally, because there is some truth to say that if you've been in the military for 20 plus years, you probably know more people. Um, but I don't know if you had any, anything to add on that one, Jason. Yeah. Um, so, so for the first one, when we talk about translators, I, I hope um, one of the bigger takeaways I hope everybody on this call kind of understands is that the private sector is looking for a specialist, right? And they're looking for it to fit into their P&L enterprise, profit and loss enterprise to fit a specific role. So we know that the military does things differently and they value the generalists. So you have to become a specialist. So you have to have a framework, tools and support to become that specialist and understand from a private sector standpoint what they want. Once you do that, the good news is it's so much easier to find a job where right now you're not feeling very confident and you're not sure what to do. It's because we've approached this from a, from the wrong perspective in the past, in my opinion. And I think moving to a 2.0 world where we talk about transformation, the need to change and the need to become aligned to the private sector is a really big deal. Um, as far as the next one, um, Aaron, when we talked about, I'm trying to eliminate, there shouldn't be separate, uh, Everyone should be doing something along these lines, whether you're a senior person, a junior person, enlisted officer, doesn't matter. What we specialize in is getting you a job in medium to large size companies, and they are very processed on how they do things because the private sector wants to eliminate, um, you know, risk. And the way they do that is part of the learn as part of the hiring process is making sure that, you know, they, they create specific roles, levels that make sure the business is functional uh, the way it should be. So I hope I answered those questions. I want to go to Jared because he's raising his hand. <laughs> go ahead, Jared. Thanks, Jason. I forget, was what's week three called? Was that on like the job market and stuff like that? Yeah, week three was uh, what the private sector wants and needs. Um, that That's really the specific part. And it's good timing on the question here because, well, yeah, go ahead. My, my, my point of question about that specific week or that discussion, do we do you get into, I guess, the, the economic landscape or kind of what's going on generally with respect to the job market itself? I know that's a broad question given everybody's probably looking at different markets or industries. But I'm just curious, is there any sort of, of hey, look here for your industry's economic um, potential, so to speak? So, so great question. Let me, let me kind of answer that by going back to the mindset heuristic where you inevitably will think, uh, just because your mind is telling you this, that your military-related job is going to be very similar to the private sector. 
I don't think that assumption is 100% true, right? The other part to that is part of our program is we encourage people to fight that mindset initially anyway, and go into a job or, or at least explore early on something that's similar to what they do now, because from a just statistical standpoint, where you're the most credentialed and experienced is where you're going to make the most money. I mean, it's just that simple. But a lot of people militarily, and you, you saw it in our survey, want to think they're thinking of doing something completely different because they think their military job and the private sector job is, is totally different or similar. So this is where the mind really becomes an obstacle. And, and we encourage people to go into where they've got a deep skill set and credentialing first. If they rule that out in the iteration, fair enough. I mean, they, they've now tested the assumption and made sure that what their mind was telling them was actually real or not. But we don't want them to miss, you know, don't, don't walk over a quarter to get to a penny. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those things. That, did that answer, Jared? Sorry if I was rambling. Yeah, did for the most part. But I guess, you know, a, a guy like me who's, who's been in service for 19 years now, I don't know if the economy is great or if it's in the, in the, you know, in, in the tank. So it's like, how do you, how do we even begin to start to analyze industries and markets that are, are hiring, right? And paying good jobs while, while also managing expectation, I guess. No, it's awesome. Um, so that's part of our method, right? Um, we, we have a, a framework. This is our proven framework we told you about. We call it the, the employment vector method, where we go through this exploration of who you are, what you want to do, and then make sure that you're reaching out to very particular subject matter experts who can fill in the gaps of knowledge that you have. Um, and that there is no silver bullet. There will not be one person who's going to tell you definitively about the market. They'll tell you about their knowledge of the market, which is why you have to do this multiple times to get multiple sources of information to get the best, most well-rounded information on an industry and a company. But once you do that, whew, you get good at it. The learning curve dampens and you start getting phenomenal information on this. This is why it's so important that it takes time. Yeah, hey Jason, I had a question on, uh, <clears throat> they're asking if the weekly calls are at a set time every week or if it's variable and if everyone in the cohort participates. Yep, so I would say, so um, there was another question, I think a direct message to me. So when we when we launched last year in March, uh, we, we've we done three cohorts. We did a cohort of four, cohort of four, and a cohort of 15. This next cohort, we're expecting 25. Just, just to give you an idea, 25 to 50, in 2022 for each class. That's the expectation. Um, there is a call once a week, like uh, Aaron was just asking about. It is it is Thursday night. It's, it's right what this is now, Thursday night, six to seven Mountain Standard Time. Every call is recorded if you can't make it. And then it goes to the learning management system the next day so you can listen to the recording. Um, I mean, we're really here to make sure you got uh, the support. We do get, I want to say, 80, 85% participation in person from the cohorts. Um, it has been pretty much the standard. And there was one other uh, quick question asking if the cost was a one-time fee. Yep. So there is a one-time fee. Uh, that we haven't had anyone actually ask for something different. Um, I don't know. I think we could probably work on something else, like maybe two. Um, let me know if that becomes problematic for anybody by, you know, instant messaging me or emailing me. And I'll put in my email down here. Uh, great question. Jason at Preveteran. Okay, so I, I, I do want to respect your time. Again, I am very happy to wait around for as till the last question. So please keep firing away. Um, what I will also do is make sure that uh, everyone has access to this uh, recording so you can listen to it again, consider, talk with your family, whatever you need to do. I'm um, here as a resource if you have additional questions that you just come up as, you know, uh, this evening or tomorrow. 
reach out to me on LinkedIn. I think I've tried to reach out to everyone on this uh, that I hadn't been connected before on LinkedIn. So any other questions? Hey, Jason, this is Brian. Uh, so just, I guess it just wasn't well. So from the job search to the, to the landing the job, is that what the 497? So once you learn your transformational 2.0, uh, that guarantees that I will have a landed job, a lucrative uh, compensation. Um, and then kind of a second tier question in that. So what's my return on investment? So what's your average increase of base salary plus negotiations of my um, year end bonuses that, that, that you've been able to give uh, your cohorts over? So I'll be very upfront. No one can promise what you're asking. No one, right? Because you're part, you're the biggest part of the equation, right? So what we do guarantee in this course is you do get the framework tools and support to make sure that you are zeroing in on an industry or sorry, an industry company job and level. So you can actually go to a job board. Um, you bring up one other point and somebody else brought this up too. We've had 23 graduates of the employment prep course 22 of the 23 still have at least a year left. So they haven't been through transition. The one person who's been through transition, um, we ended up getting him an additional $40,000 on top of his original offer. That is a different course, right? And we've, we have two courses. The other one is negotiate the highest possible salary and benefits. Same price. They are bifurcated or separated because we know that you need to go through this transformation and then once you've identified that job, then you roll into the salary course where then you get those additional thousands, if not tens of thousands of bucks. And again, the first guy went through 40 grand on top of his initial offer. So that would be a pretty healthy return on investment. Got it. And then uh, do, you, do you come out of the program with uh, a resume? Um so that that part is covered in our, our salary course, because what the reason why you need to figure out what you do before you create a resume, right? It's going to be, I, I get general resume versus targeted resume. I understand all that. But the first thing we really do is got to have you explore who you are, what you want to do, and go test all those assumptions that you have against the private sector. That's where the real opportunity is. I'm not saying you shouldn't stay in the public sector, but I'm telling you the numbers out there indicate that 92% of you transitioning are going to the employment workforce, 70% up to 70% are going to the private sector. So why not become a line now? That's what, that's what we do. And Jason, after some time doing some resumes, I'll just say that I did both. I set up a general resume. I set up some targeted resumes for like three different industries I was looking at. But guess what? When it came to submitting those for any kind of job offering that was out there, I had to pretty much completely change each resume yep. for that specific job. And if I didn't, I had zero chance of that finding success at all. Because if you look at the description, like we mentioned, the employer's job description and the role description for that specific job is like their um, resume to you. And if you don't look at that and specifically address what they're looking for, they're not even going to look at your resume. So. Um, that's, I guess, the feedback I would give on that is like you can prepare these things, but until you know the specific exact job you are seeking, you are wasting your time in a sense doing resumes. Totally agree. And then Narvell says the same thing. So Narvell is, is he's been through our class and then he also works with Lockheed Martin. So, you know, we're both in industry. I'm still a full time employee with uh, an aerospace company. Um, we can definitely tell you that the resume is almost the last thing you do. It's the first thing you do once you've identified the job role and level, because then you bake those keywords into your resume to make sure you're getting past the first thing. But of course, you'd like somebody to walk your resume into an office of the hiring manager, say, hey, we need Aaron, we need Josh, we need Jared. But these are just different things you do. But man, you can't do that now. You have, There's work to be done on yourself to make sure that you're aligned and thinking differently. And then lots of other things fall into place after that. Roger, I concur. I, you know, I, I, like I said, you got to have different buckets. That's just my two cents on this. So defense industry, 
they can read a military resume. So the preponderance of those folks are military individuals. They know exactly what positions they were. So that's a different bucket. Your corporate world, completely different story. And so you're being told, this is what I'm getting at, which is kind of the frustration. You get these mixed messages. So, you know, they want you to civilianize it as, as much as you can. Well, no one can tell me that my, uh, you know, my fire support officer, what the hell, do, you know, what is that? You know what I mean? And I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I'll just make something, you know, I'll MSU it. I don't know what the heck that equates to on the private sector. And so that's the, that's the frustrating part is, is when I'm, you know, because that's the goal. My goal is to get into the corporate world um, and, and being able to translate your military experience to the way that they comprehend it is, is, is not an easy thing to do. I, you know, I have a lot of experience and it's still very complicated and we don't get the support we need uh, when it comes to that translation. And, you know, then you'll sit with these recruiters, right? And so, it, 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 you know, us military, it'd be like, hey, company, just standardize the damn thing and <laughs> let us have it, you know, instead of individualizing it. But each recruiter reads a the resume their own way and you're going to get plucked and, you know, those are just some of my uh, frustrations as I'm going through this the second time. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to agree. What you're saying resonates with me, right? But the way I categorize that now is that that's a, that's a 1.0 kind of thinking process. The translation thing needs to go away um, because it insinuates, even if it doesn't come out and say it, it insinuates, you don't need to change. It's just, I need to look like something else to the private sector. That is just not true. I mean, you have to understand what the private sector needs and wants. And once you do that, it becomes infinitely easier to figure out how you provide value to that, that enterprise. Um, but but that, that takes a little bit of time and it takes a mindset shift. And this is exactly what we're talking about. So I, I know that you're, um, I, th I think we're agreeing on this. It's just, we're using a little bit different language, but the language is important. Any other questions? Yes, I have a follow-up question to my sure. previous one. Uh, the question is, if I want to sign up for the June course, do I have to wait till the next um, a time you have a, a Zoom call, or, or can I sign up now for the June class? So what we typically do in that case is we'll put you on a wait list, and here's why, right? Because each iteration of the course, um, we're not going to publish it one for one. We're going to incorporate new changes that we get from feedback from the students to continually improve it, right? So this February course, once it's done um, in March, in the March-April time period, we're going to be making the adjustments, reshooting some of the videos, adding in the additional value as things evolve, so if, if we have your email and I know that you're there, I'll, I'll put you on an, uh, a wait list. And then what happens is well before that, I'll get in touch with you and say, hey, are you still interested? It's open now. You can go enroll. Um, pretty seamless. All righty. I think we're going to call it a night then. I want to thank everybody that's here. Um, really appreciate it again. Hope you have a nice evening. And as we go into Friday, I hope you have a great weekend.